There are two purposes for our getting together today. One is to uh, dedicate the um, archives uh, that are being placed with Columbia of our history, and also to hear two really incredibly interesting panels. Uh, before, I'll get to the panels after I introduce our first guest. And he is Michael T. Ryan, who's the director of the Rare Book and Manuscript Library. Uh, he's got 30 years of experience managing libraries like this. This archive is going to be a very important repository for scholars because the uh, CPJ, which started out as kind of uh, just a, a wild little group, has become uh, an institution that is actually uh, quite unique and has uh, played a key role in the development of the free press movement around the world in the last 30 years. None of us realized that's what would happen when it started. I think there were three major things that uh, contributed to this and will probably come out in the panels. One was uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, which uh, opened up uh, a huge uh, chaotic opportunity for free press in countries which had been under their thumb before. Uh, there, were, there were ethnic conflicts, uh, racial conflicts, political conflicts, and uh, the, what we learned there is that certain people have sort of an innate uh, inborn feeling that they want to be journalists, even if they don't know how to do it. Uh, they, even if you hang them by their thumbs, they're going to start being journalists. And that's what happened in these countries. They didn't know how to do it. It was very similar to what happened in the history of the United States just after our revolution when all sorts of people uh, appeared and started writing all sorts of ad hom exuberant ad hominem attacks on everybody in power. This happened in these countries and it scared the hell out of the leaders and they started jailing journalists. So the CPJ, which had recently started, was positioned to uh, try to address that and our organization grew at a rapid rate because of this demand. Also when the Soviets collapsed, uh, the secular uh, Arab groups and Islam, uh, groups in Islamic countries that they backed uh, lost power and uh, religious zealots began to fill the vacuum. And uh, that's another problem that journalists have to deal with now. And regular armies began to fall by the wayside and uh, you had the rise of uh, paramilitaries characterized by 14 year old illiterate boys holding an automatic weapon at you. They never had heard of, they didn't know what a journalist was. There was none of the niceties of, of what had preceded that. So I think that the archives will be uh, an invaluable resource for uh, scholars when they begin to write up, begin to interpret what's happening in this period. I'd like Michael Ryan to come up and uh, give us a few words about that and then we'll turn to the panel. Thank you. Th thanks, thanks, Josh. And uh, I'm delighted on behalf of the Columbia Libraries to welcome you all here today. It's great to be here. It's great to have you all here. It's a great honor and privilege for all of us now in the libraries to be formally connected with the CPJ, which is an organization that has earned our esteem and, and admiration over a long period of time. As I was listening to Michael Massing and Ann Nelson reflect on the earliest days of CPJ last night, you know, the, the two and a half staff positions in the IBM Selectric and the bloated fax machine, I thought of the beginning of Lawrence Stern's Tristram Shandy, which I'm going to blow completely, so those of you who remember it better than I do, be quiet. But it goes something like, <clears throat> the author writes, if only my, my parents had known what they were up to when they begot me, they might have thought differently. And I was, and I was just thinking about uh, Anne and Michael trying to struggle with the demands of uh, no money, with, with the challenges of no money, uh, a few, few pieces of paper, a telephone, and uh, a lot of energy and goodwill. 
knowing that they were in fact beginning to create a legacy that would someday wind up in a library as an object of study for scholars. And that's in fact what they and some of you who are part of the CPJ have created. A smart scholar in Columbia's history department last year published a really good book, which I recommend to you if you haven't read it, called The Last Utopia. In it, Sam Moyne, who is the author, argues in effect that uh, the last quarter of the 20th century and up to the present is probably no better defined than by the, uh, the emergence and spread of the human rights movement. Human rights is what recent history, not only in this country, but globally, has been all about. In fact, one could call that long moment from about 1975 to the present the human rights moment. Um, that's why, in part, in 2004, the Columbia Libraries established the Center for Human Rights Documentation and Research to acquire, preserve, and make accessible the papers and records of significant people and organizations who have played major roles in the human rights moment. Uh, thus, we've been able to, to acquire, over a period of time, records relating to Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, Committee for Concerned Scientists, uh, Human Rights First, which is the old Lawyers for Human Rights organization, and most recently, the Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, with the acquisition of the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, we feel like we have acquired what has become the epicenter of the human rights moment today. That is probably an organization that is best placed, best positioned to, to observe, record, and, 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 and record on uh, the significant human rights moments, movements of today. As Joel Simon was observing last evening, uh, the transformations by technology in the nature of journalism and journalists has empowered every man to become, in effect, uh, a journalist. And that makes the scope of a group like Committee to Protect Journalists enormous and enormously important. And recognizing that uh, is all the more humbling for those of us in the library uh, who feel doubly privileged to be able to now look after, steward the legacy of an organization that has achieved so much and is positioned to achieve so much more. Uh, I hope that uh, the, you enjoy your stay here this afternoon. There's a reception uh, immediately following the second panel, which I hope you will stay for and we can mingle and talk some more. But now for the Columbia Libraries, let me turn it back to Josh and the program. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little about how I got involved with the Committee to Protect Journalists because it involves two of the people sitting here. Uh, I was a reporter in Beirut in 1983. Uh, it was the first time I was covering a conflict. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> people kept shooting at me. It was scaring the hell out of me. And I went over to the AP office to send some pictures. And I found this gruff ex-Marine sitting there, and the bureau chief. And it was this guy over here, Terry Anderson. He immediately saw that I didn't know what the hell I was doing and uh, probably helped me survive that experience. I've spent a month there. Uh, a couple of years later, I had occasion to win the Pulitzer Prize and then for international reporting. And about a month or two later, a TWA airplane was hijacked in Lebanon. I don't know if you remember, but there was an iconic photograph of one of the hijackers holding the pilot around the head with a gun. And Ronald Reagan, man of great principle, made a deal to free these people. I, don't, I forget what he gave in, a, in a exchange. And Peggy Say, Terry's sister, was very upset. And she said, what about my brother? <laughs> he had just been kidnapped about a year before that, I guess, right? And uh, she said that several times. So I called her up. I said, who I was, and I said, uh, Terry was very generous to me when I was in Beirut, and uh, I'll do anything I can. I mean, I have this prize. I don't know what that entitles me to do. If I can make a statement, I'll do that, whatever. We wound up with a dinner at my house on the west side. Uh, my my uh, wife cooked a turkey. 
my 10-year-old daughter served it. I invited a lot of journalists that I knew so Peggy could explain what was happening with her brother. I began to realize in that experience that there was no, I thought there'd be a lot of groups to deal with this. There weren't, but there was a woman named Barbara Cop Capel uh, who was, uh, and her assistant who came to the meeting. At that time, the staff was a staff of one and a half. Her assistant, Miriam, was the half. So uh, my daughter served the turkey, we talked, and a few weeks later, I got a call from Barbara Coppell, and she said, did I want to come to a board meeting of this organization? So I went down there. Then a few weeks later, she said, or someone said, do you want to be on the board? <laughs> I said, oh, okay. The board then consisted of uh, Victor Navasky, Michael, and Ari A. Nair in reality. I mean, there were other famous guys like Dan Rather, and uh, I thought I'd see him when I went to the meeting, but he wasn't. He didn't have time for these little meetings where we'd sit around. So uh, then a few months later, they said, how would you like to be the chairman? Because Dave Marish has gotten a job and he's going down to Washington. So that opened up uh, really what has become probably the most significant experience almost 30 years ago in my life. I've gotten a notary. I worked very hard. We made that our priority until we got him out. I was thrilled to see him when he did get out. He generously agreed to serve on the board. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say today. I want to turn to Dan Rather, because he's one of the reasons that I said, OK, I'll be on the board. I thought, well, I'm going to hang out with Dan Rather. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dan Rather, I don't, you know, I, people my age, for people my age, he was always there. Dan, when I was uh, in college, I first saw Dan Rather during the assassination of JFK. And he was jumping around and, you know, you couldn't miss him. And uh, I'm not really going to say much about Dan Rather's background because if you don't know about it, I'm not sure why you're here at the meeting. <laughs> I mean, he's like uh, been an, uh, an iconic figure during our lives, and especially for journalists. The thing about Dan Rather is that he has a lot of guts. He takes a lot of risks. Sometimes they work out, sometimes they don't. <laughs> and his... He really was very uh, crucial in our, our uh, success because we needed people who had credibility. I mean, after all, most of us, with the exception of Victor, maybe he was a grown up, but most of us were just pishers hanging around. And uh, that was a risk for Dan. He was making a lot of money. He had a very important reputation. It could have been easily damaged uh, by hanging out with these bomb throwers. Uh, and it, luckily it wasn't. It wasn't until much later that all of these famous celebrity journalists who we now have on our board finally felt it was safe enough to come on our board. And I think Dan really uh, has never gotten the, uh, the credit that he should have gotten for the, for the integrity and the guts that he exhibited in risking a lot to help us and, uh, thus, and thus helping us succeed. So, now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dan to uh, uh, moderate our first panel. He'll introduce the panelists, and uh, then I'll come back, and I'll put it to a vote whether we want to have a break or not. Otherwise, you can sneak out, and then we'll do our second panel. This is going to be a very jam-packed afternoon. Dan Rather. Thank you very much, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I trust you all know what Abraham Lincoln said about overly generous introductions. Honest Abe said, never take time to deny it. The audience will find out the truth soon enough for themselves. <laughs> and so it will be with you here this afternoon. We have a lot of ground we want to cover, including opening this up to uh, questions. But uh, just as a starting point, let me say that we're here uh, as part of the celebration of 30 years of covering war uh, from Central America to Afghanistan. The Committee to Protect Journalists has stood side by side with journalists covering conflict all around the globe. But how have the risks changed over the years? One of the things we want to discuss here this afternoon. In El Salvador, journalists assumed it was a widespread, I would say unanimous assumption that visibility increased safety. And 
journalists, including this one and some members of the panel at least, drove across the front line in cars marked boldly press. Security consultants were unknown to journalists in that, in that era. In Iraq and Afghanistan, journalists have adopted various new strategies to meet the new world of journalism coverage, keeping a low profile, sometimes traveling with armed guards, depending on the individual and the organization, sometimes without, but always assuming now in anything approaching a battlefield that journalists are a potential target. So one of our questions is, how does the way journalists operate in conflict zones affect the wars, the way wars are covered uh, today? How war correspondence has changed uh, over the years, over the history of CPJ? And then the larger issue that we're hoping to explore is that how the shifting security environment for journalists affects the way that journalists cover and the public perceives conflicts. Now, before I introduce our panel of guests, I hope you'll give me, if you have to call it an anchorman indulgence, an anchorman indulgence. Um, Lara Logan, a distinguished CBS News correspondent, had intended to be here with us on the panel today, but while she was covering in Egypt, uh, untoward events happened uh, to her, and she can't be here today, so I hope you'll join me in keeping her very much in mind. Also, I'd be derelict if I didn't uh, pause and recognize uh, two people in the audience to whom I owe a great deal. One, uh, CPJ own, owes its very existence uh, to Dr. Lauren Ordell, who's in our audience today. Laurie. Laurie and Michael Massey founded the outfit. Uh, Laurie was uh, a uh, worker bee at CBS News at the time when I met her, and she talked about CPJ. Uh, she's now a, a, a full-fledged PhD, what we call in Texas a FUD. Uh, <laughs> welcome, Laurie, and I'm honored by your presence. Uh, Mrs. Fred Friendly, Ruth Friendly is here, uh, wife of the late and rightfully legendary Fred Friendly, Ruth. We're honored to be in your presence today. <laughs> now, let me introduce our panel. And I could read for the next 15 minutes at least on each and every member of this panel. Um, don't draw too deep a sigh. I'm not going to do that. Uh, I think you know most of these people, if not by face, uh, by byline, or by their photographs. Terry Anderson, a former uh, chief Middle East correspondent for the Associated Press. He was held hostage for seven years, exclamation point, seven years by a Shiite Hezbollah partisans attempting to drive the United States out of Lebanon during the long and tragic Lebanese Civil War. He's the author of the bestseller, Den of Lions, an account of his years as a hostage. Since his release as a hostage in 1991, Anderson has worked as a journalist. He's run, a, run several small businesses, taught at various journalism schools, and in 1909, he joined the faculty at the University of Kentucky Journalism School. He's a CPJ board member, and by the way, he'll be embarrassed to hear me say this, but a heavy contributor not only of his time and his talent, but also of his money to CPJ. Uh, he has received any number of awards, uh, both for journalism and community service, including the first Free Spirit Award from the Freedom Forum. Terry, we're glad you're here this afternoon. We have these people in no particular order. Some order may emerge with the questioning, but Maria Teresa Ronderas serves as editorial advisor to Revista Semana. She's a columnist for El Spectador, as well as a member of the boards of the Committee to Protect Journalists and the Foundation for Freedom of the Press. She has been editor of various Colombian news organizations. She was a Knight Fellow at Stanford University was awarded the King of Spain Prize in 1997 and the Maria Moore's Capita Award in 2007. Anderos is the author, among other things, of Punch uh, and also Five in Humor. We're delighted you're with us today, Mayor Teresa. Thank you so much for being with us. Rajiv uh, Chandra Sakharan, he is senior correspondent and associate editor of the Washington Post. 
He has served as, and listen to this, the Post National Editor, as an Assistant Managing Editor, and he ran the Post Bureau in Baghdad from 2003 to 2004. He is also a CPJ board member. He authored the best-selling book, Imperial Life in the Emerald City, which is a chronicle of the U.S. Con reconstruction efforts of, in Iraq. His other foreign assignments include serving as Cairo Bureau Chief and Southeast Asia Correspondent and reporting on the war in Afghanistan. Rajiv, thank you for being with us this afternoon. <laughs> Michael Camber is an award-winning freelance photojournalist and journalist whose photographs have been published in nearly every major news magazine in the United States and Europe. He has covered conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, Liberia, Sudan, Somalia, and numerous other countries. Fair to say that in his adult life, when there's been the sound of gunfire, he's probably been there. He is currently under contract to the New York Times. Michael, thank you for being with us this afternoon. I want to start with Terry with the questions, but I ask you to keep in mind as you go along. I don't speak for any other member of the panel, although I believe what I'm about to say to you is shared uh, by each and every one of them. Uh, there is nothing glorious about war. Uh, this is fundamental. You can say, well, that's sophomoric even to say so, but I think particularly as a person who after starting in print and wandering into radio wound up in television, there's a tendency for television flattens things out. Television is great at doing some things. Uh, the best thing it does is it literally takes you there on the proverbial magic carpet. But television has difficulty with depth, perspective, context. And I worry sometimes, particularly about television, about all war reporting, but particularly about television, that what it leaves out is the savagery of it. You all know this, but as we talk this afternoon about war coverage, it's worth reminding ourselves is that war is whatever is below hell is war. It's not only savage and brutal. In real terms, it is real mud, real blood, real screams of the wounded, and moans of the dying. So let's not forget that. When we talk about war coverage, it's a tendency to glorify war and war coverage to talk about people who cover wars as heroes. Nobody who has actually walked the ground on a battlefield and covered war has considered himself or herself a hero. There are all heroes who fight wars. Uh, I would suggest that none of us who have covered war want to be considered heroes. What we want to be considered is as witnesses to what I described war as before. Having said that, let's get to our, our panel. Uh, I didn't mention with Terry Anderson, he's also an amateur historian um, on world reporting. Terry, I want to ask you, based on your experience, to give us a long-term perspective and relate your own personal experience as a hostage, the long-term perspective on how war coverage during your lifetime and during the 30 years of CPJ uh, has evolved and developed. Well, Dan, I can give you the perspective of what I've seen over a fairly long life, I will remind you that you and I first met at the Da Nang Press Center in 1969 when I was a young Marine Star Sergeant. Long by the time of the, the, the Napoleonic campaigns or yeah. was it the Caesars campaigns? <laughs> and you were a young CBS star and among our duties as uh, kind of assistance to civilian journalist, as well as being correspondents of our own for the Marine Corps, was making the late night run to the airport with the network's film bags That's to true. catch the jet to Saigon. Film bags, 16 millimeter film, which had to go on a jet to Saigon overnight. Actually on a prop, prop plane. Prop plane, that's right. It was prop plane, it wasn't a jet and then on to the United States, where it was edited and put on television and where it had such an enormous effect on the people who were watching it, which may, by the way, call into question our need for immediate 24-hour news, 
since that war seemed to be pretty thoroughly covered. But it will give you an example of the kinds of things uh, that we dealt with that were so simple that you don't think about today. Simple things, like this. Didn't exist. Didn't exist. In Vietnam, it took days to get a story back uh, for the networks. Um, it might take days to get a story back from the field. We had free access. You could go anywhere you wanted to go, or were brave enough or stupid enough to go. You could get the information, even when it was directly counter to what the official spokesmen were saying, but it might take you days to get it back to the states. Um, even in Lebanon in the 1980s, remember when the Marine barracks went up? Um, I and some other correspondents, including Robert Fisk, were there within minutes after that explosion. We saw the devastation, the bodies, um, the Marines, there were two. I remember when we went through the fence where it had been knocked down, there were two Marines with M16s crying, just standing there and crying. And we got basic information within 10 minutes and I had to turn around to Fisk and say, cover me, get back in the car, drive 10 miles, even to find a working telephone, get it back to the AP. And now, anywhere in the world you're covering a war, even in, you know, the back country of Africa, you've got a satellite phone. It's instantaneous. And that has not only changed your ability to get the story back, it has changed the demands on you as a journalist, because it's technically possible, and they want you to do it. Now, and what does that mean? Well, that means you don't get much time to think about it. You don't get much time to really investigate, to spend time on the story to find out what's going on, and what's behind the events that you're witnessing and trying to report on. Pour it out. Get on your satellite phone, pour it out, and it goes straight out onto the air. Uh, or onto the, to the web. And that, that makes, I think, major changes philosophically about the way we cover war. Good? Bad? Mm. I don't know. You are there. What did we see in Egypt? 24 hours a day. You were there in Tahrir Square talking to those people through those wonderful journalists and Al Jazeera and, and uh, others, 24 hours a day as it was uh, happening to them. You were watching it. Um, that's good, I think. Uh, that's a, a good effect of the technological changes. On the other hand, how many of those network correspondents standing on the balcony in front of the camera had really had a chance to find out what was going on? How many of them were just telling you what somebody had told them. You know, sure, it's changed. It's changed in major ways uh, for the better and for the worse. Uh, the impact of the web is something we haven't even begun to figure out, except we know we have to deal with it. And at the CPJ, uh, they're dealing with it. Uh, in, in it's changed the way we re report news about attacks on the press in major ways. Uh, again, I sometimes wonder whether it's all good or bad. Still, technology aside, um, covering wars, as Dan said, a terrible thing, because war is a terrible thing. What we have now is the ability to see instantly what is happening to people on the ground? Um, is that changing our attitudes? Is that changing what we think about war? Somehow, in several years of covering an intense, nasty, dirty, violent war in Lebanon, I've never been convinced we really showed America what that war was about or what it was really like. 
when I see, when I watch the coverage of the Iran-Iraq war. All the technology in the world, 24-hour coverage. Do Americans really understand what that war was like on the ground? What it was like for Iraqis? What it did to Iraq as a nation? What it is doing to it now? Michael, you just came back from Afghanistan. I mean, the coverage of Afghanistan doesn't lack, but are we really showing America what's happening on the ground, what it's doing to Afghanistan, what that war is about? The technology, I think, makes some things easier, but it doesn't make our real job any easier. Our real job is to show you what happens in war, what happens to real people, ordinary people. Not talk to generals, not talk to the defense minister, not talk to people at the embassy, but to show you the real effect of war, which is on ordinary men, women, and children. It is not only, or even primarily, guys with guns who get killed in war. And I think that is something that we still fail to understand. I couldn't agree more with that, and I'm sure the other members of the panel do, but if there are any uh, aspiring young journalists among the students in the room, let me just footnote um, with an asterisk what uh, Terry alluded to. Uh, absolutely essential to anything approaching uh, responsible war coverage, talk to captains, sergeants, and civilians. So often, and I do not exclude myself from this criticism, what you wind up doing is talking to colonels, generals, and admirals, and very seldom any civilians. But if you are anytime soon or later thrust into a war zone, just mark it down, remind yourself every day, captains, sergeants, and civilians, and that will increase your chances of being a good, really good war correspondent tremendously. I want to move on now to Maria Teresa, and, um, who is, let me pause and say, a truly fearless chronicler of political violence in her own country. And Maria Teresa, anything that you want to say, bouncing off of our friend Terry, but I'm particularly interested in the audience hearing what it's like to cover war in your own country. Well, I think the, the, main, uh, the main difference is that you don't get out. <laughs> you, you stay there, and you cannot change the subject. Um, when when you, you, you see correspondents there one day here, and then they change, and then they have a new reality in a different country, and, and, but you, you still, you have to cover the same reality, and you cannot just change the channel. So uh, I think that's a, a big difference. I think there's a lot of advantages in the sense that you know the context better, you can access better, uh, but also you can suffer the consequences. You are there, particularly uh, the, the, the reporters who are in the local, in the, in the, in the towns, in the regions. Um, much more so than, for example, somebody like me who's in the city. Um, I think there is another big difference between being a correspondent, even though we have these technologies and all of these. I think when you are inside a country, you, you lack the distance. You, you cannot see, sometimes you get used to madness. You live in a completely crazy place and you don't, you, you, you assume it as, as your life. Some of my friends that who have come out from abroad to cover uh, some moments, uh, terrible moments in Colombia, for example, when Escobar was blowing up buildings and killing people, or when we, at the height of the paramilitary war, and they, they, uh, they would ask me things that make me realize that I thought they were normal, like you couldn't, you, you don't say that a place is dangerous or not dangerous. It depends on the hour or the time. For example, if you go from, uh, gorillas, for example, like to sleep late. So if you go early in the morning, you're safe. If you go after 10.30, that's, 
That's complicated. No. So people wouldn't understand that. How, how can you say a road is safe some hours of the day and not safe the other hours of the day? So that's something that it makes you learn a lot when you talk to somebody that comes from abroad in that way. Now, what, what has changed a lot, I think it's two things, one really bad thing and one really good thing in Latin America. When I started to be a, a reporter, I started in Argentina right after uh, the end of the military dictatorship. And that was wonderful because it was the end of hell. It was like you could go out, you could talk, you could, you could uh, denounce, you could do investigative reporting with the, with the m mothers of Plaza de Mayo. And, but when you were in, and, and uh, it was like wars had an end and dictatorships had an end in many countries in Latin America. The problem with other countries and the problem we are facing now is that the wars don't have an end. The wars just change, shift, transform. So today we have, for example, in Colombia or in El Salvador or in Guatemala, we have, technically the wars are more or less over even though in Colombia we still have a guerrilla, but it, it has shifted now and become a, like a, a cr criminal kind of organized crime kind of war but still has a lot of political power and it's still the main regions. And, and so it's very, very difficult to sort of grab it and, and, and there's no end to it. So it's hopeless, it, it's more hopeless. I don't know if that, you can say that in English, but it's a little bit more like you, when will it ever end? Sometimes I feel very uh, sad when I go back to a place where I have been 10 years ago and I see exactly the same things going on. Just different actors, but the same things going on. Uh, the other thing is that internal wars are, as opposed to international wars, are more pervasive, I think in a way, but more invisible too. Um, in Colombia, we had 1,300 massacres in 10 years, 97 to 2007, and, and we had a, around three million peasants displaced. And uh, you could ask a Colombian in any of the cities and they would probably tell you that's nothing. Or they would see something in television going on in, in Sudan and they would say, oh, those people, how much they have suffered. And they don't know their own country. It's so far away because you can live a normal city, a normal life in the city and never be exposed to the violence in the countryside. And so that, I think that's a, one of the biggest negative differences in the last years. But one good difference is that we have become much more organized to, to resist and to see and to f face that kind of danger. In Latin America, there's now maybe, that I know of, 10 different organizations, local organizations, that are pushing for access to information for protection of journalists, for protection of freedom of e expression. And <coughs> we have developed very fine kind of uh, strategies. For example, how to protect a local reporter when they give you information, either foreign correspondence or national correspondence, and so that the bad guys never get to know who gave the information. So we, give, we, we have developed this strategies in which they give us the information. We make, actually, we make a big fuss and go to their town and make a big fuss and go out and be seen so that people think we are gathering the information, but it's really them, the ones who have the information. And then we publish it and then they say, Semana said such and such thing and, and they're never to blame. You know, they're completely covered. Because one thing that's really responsible that we've seen done, especially foreign correspondents, is that they come in town, they use the local reporters, and they don't realize they put them in danger. Once they leave, that local reporter has been seen with the foreign. We had a very, very sad experience uh, that us as national media with a local uh, media town reporter and we went and talked to him without realizing that he was being watched 
and three days later he was gunned down and, and fortunately he wasn't killed, but it was a very uh, ha uh, painful experience and we learned from that. And, and, and so we've developed a lot of ways of, on how to protect ourselves and how to uh, do strategies to, to do better so that we can tell the information, we can shed light on obscure places with the, the only hope of people is that you are able to get there and tell the story, but then you have to spend a lot of time on how do you tell that story without put, putting the people, your sources, and the other journalists in danger. That's, that's a main part of the planning of a story. Absolutely. Rajiv, and I have in mind again, uh, when I read the introduction to you, the number of very responsible positions you've held, both up and down in journalism, uh, is remarkable. I want to ask you to contrast coverage of Iraq with the coverage of Afghanistan. Let's think back to Baghdad 2003. American newspapers that had a presence there. Obviously, the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, back then, Los Angeles Times. Let me go down the list. Just, I'm, riffing here. Chicago Tribune, Boston Globe, New York Newsday, New York Star Ledger, Atlanta Journal Constitution, Dallas Morning News, San Francisco Chronicle, uh, San Diego Union Tribune, um, and I'm probably missing a few. Today, Kabul, four American newspapers with bureaus there. New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street <coughs> Journal, and uh, the Tribune Company. When you look at, 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 at the change in at the American TV footprint too, I mean, it's, it's amazing. So. Um, far, far less coverage. You look at, you look at the number of, of minutes on the evening news. I mean, Terry posed this question, has, has, this, has, has all this march of technology, the fact that I can be in the, in the deserts of Helmand province and I can get a broadband connection with a, with a began phone and, and, and make a voice call within 20 seconds with a Thoraya out here, has that, has that in, increased America's understanding of, of the conflicts? And I, I would say probably not. I bet there are fewer minutes devoted on, on the nightly news today to conflict, even though there are 100 plus thousand U.S. military personnel in Afghanistan. We're sure. spending, you know, on the order of, 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 you know, dozens of billions of dollars a year for, for the civ mill presence over there, um, compared to Iraq, compared to uh, 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 the, uh, the wars uh, of, of in, the, in the 1980s, and particularly to, to Vietnam. Um, uh, and it's, you know, it's not just, it's not just you know, budget cuts and, and fewer minutes on television and, and general inattention. Um, you know, maybe maybe um, those, you know, those like Josh and others who covered um, conflicts in, 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 in the Middle East and in Latin America in, in the 1980s will accuse me of sort of looking back on this with rose-tinted glasses. But, you know, I have this great sort of image of, of those enterprising correspondents down there in, in Latin America in the 80s who would, you know, wake up in the Hotel Nacional, decide to sort of, okay, we're going to go and see the, you know, the gorillas today, get in the car, drive out there, you know, talk to the local padre, talk to some, some uh, eyewitnesses, uh, go to the hospital, uh, you know, get both sides of the story, drive back to the Hotel Nacional, tell X their story, and have a cervecita by the pool. <laughs> and if only our lives were like that in, in, in Afghanistan. I'm not trying to like whinge here. I'm not trying to say, oh, you know, this is it's so much worse today. But, but, and put aside the beers in the Hotel Nacional, the sheer difficulty of trying to get those other voices. I mean, I agree with you, Dan. Captains, sergeants, civilians. But, it's next to impossible. When you're out on an embed, you know, the captains and sergeants have been told, only speak about your lane. You're not talking about policy. You're not talking about anything else. So it's very difficult to get people to sort of really open up to you about their, their true thoughts on the military side. And then on the civilian side, well, you get outside Kabul and you go into the places where the insurgency is, 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 is strongest, where the, where the conflict is most intense, where the U.S. presence is greatest in southern and eastern Afghanistan. Much of that country, you cannot travel on your own. They're just impossible to do so. 
uh, you know, unless you have a, a total death wish. So you're forced to travel with the US military. So you're seeing the world through the inch thick bulletproof glass of an MRAP or a Humvee. Exactly. And if you're talking to somebody, it's a conversation that is intermediated by a military translator or affected by the presence of uniformed soldiers with guns. So you, know, you think people are gonna really open up to you? So it becomes very, very difficult to get that sort of uh, independent accountability type reporting. That's what, the, what foreign correspondents are supposed to do. Otherwise, you know, just sit in the Pentagon press room and regurgitate press releases. You're supposed to, and so we, we all try, but it is very, very difficult to make that happen. And so, you know, you, even, even between Baghdad, and I'll, I'll finish up on this, this, this little point here, between Iraq and Afghanistan, there's a major difference. In Iraq, when, when the going got rough, and, and journalists were largely forced to, to remain quartered in their bureaus and their hotel rooms in Baghdad starting in, in the summer of 2004 and going on for several years. You could still get a sense of the conflict there because so much of it was actually playing out in the city. You could drive out quickly to one neighborhood and back or go do one appointment. You had creative ways to get around it. I, you know, we, we all had you know, armored vehicles and after a while we all engaged in our little tricks. You know, I, I don't know if any of you remember that MTV show, Pimp My Ride, you know. I engaged in the Baghdad equivalent of that. I convinced my bosses to spring for a hundred grand to buy an armored Jeep Cherokee and then another hundred grand to buy a second one. And when it became a little too dangerous to be driving around in shiny, bright silver painted Jeep Cherokees for the bargain basement price of 60 bucks a piece, I had them taken to Sadr City and pimped out as Shiite ghetto mobiles. One, one, one literally became the flower of Lebanon taxi cab with, with carpeting on the dashboard and fuzzy dice. And the great, great little trick was that we had laminated pictures of uh, Imam Hussein and Abbas with little uh, suction cups that you could put on the back window if you're driving to a Shiite neighborhood to look suitably pious. If you're going to a Sunni neighborhood, you'd pull them off, roll them up, and jam them under the seat. Um, but you could get, the point here is you could get a sense of what was happening in Iraq, even if you were largely quartered in Baghdad. Kabul is a bubble. Kabul is divorced from the true nature of the conflict in southern and eastern Afghanistan. So news organizations stay in Kabul. They can talk to Afghan government officials. They can talk to US diplomats. They can talk to military commanders. But but you really don't see it playing out. So the only way to see that stuff is through military embeds. And, and that, as I noted, brings its own set of, of real restrictions. So our ability to really get a sense of what's playing out on the ground, and to add to that, at least in Iraq, because news organizations had money, because they were able to operate with a permissive year, many of them were able to build networks of stringers and freelancers so we could find out what was happening in Basra and Mosul and Ramadi. Right now, as we're, you know, the U.S. has surged up in Iraq in the 10th year of a war, most organizations don't have people in all these other parts of the country, so you can't even turn to trusted Afghan journalists to convey that stuff. So sure. we're really seeing that conflict through a soda straw. Absolutely. Mike, been a long time getting to you, and for that I apologize. But discuss for us what it's like to cover the war uh, as a photographer. You know, I think we get up every day and we try to think about how we're going to get that one image that is going to bring something home about the war today. Uh, and, you know, I mean, we're doing a number of things. Some days we're embedding. Uh, I just did this a few months in, in Afghanistan, so we're probably embedded half the time. Half the time we're out there on the streets. Um, as Rajiv said, we're, we're trying to be as undercover as possible. So, you know, we're dressing locally. We're getting local haircuts, growing beards. Um, keeping our cameras out of sight. Um, but you're trying to think about, how am I going to get this one image that's going to bring this war home to people today? Um, and you know, sometimes, again, we'll, we'll, we'll go to bomb scenes or um, someplace, especially when there was fighting in Baghdad. Uh, you know, I, I was working there as recently as this year, as 2010. And um, you, know, you try to get in and out in, in 10 minutes. You know, you've got maybe 10 minutes to be on the scene and get something and get away before people start making phone calls and reporting that you're there. Uh, you sometimes use point and shoot cameras to, to try to, uh, to look like a, a local, or you even use cell phones if you have to. Um, you know, you, you do whatever it is, but um, you know, we're just, we're extremely limited. We're working literally with a price on our heads. We're worth an enormous amount of money, as Maria Teresa spoke about earlier. Uh, people, if they don't want to kidnap you for ideological reasons, they can kidnap you and sell you. So you're constantly working under these, uh, these constraints. Uh, with the US military, we're, you know, we're out, we're on patrols, we're trying to do 
the best we can to show the combat, to show the cost, uh, on, on, particularly on civilians, but also on, on soldiers, on Afghan civilians, Iraqi civilians. Uh, it's tough, you know, the soldiers, it's, kind of, it's astonishing. You can fly to Dubai and, and, uh, or Kuwait, I believe, and, and the U.S. military will pick you up and take you on an embed, and they'll feed you and give you a place to sleep, and they'll show, show you all these things. But, um, you know, you're limited in what you see. You know, many times in Baghdad, I don't know if Rajiv had this experience, but, um, you know, I had, I had soldiers, there would be active combat going on, and they would say, um, you know, you're showing too much of the negative stuff. We just, we just painted some schools. We're giving out soccer balls tomorrow. We want to take you on these, these things. I've saved emails from, from captains who are telling me that, you know, we don't like your take on the war and we want you to, to get on board with us. We're doing great things here. You're not seeing it. So it, it's a challenge to really photograph it and try to get home to, uh, to the Americans and really to the world what's really happening. And um, in terms of, uh, you know, I've been working on a book on Iraq and doing interviews with, with photojournalists and um, in, We've had over 4,000 U.S. You know, combat deaths there. I was only able to find six pictures of dead U.S. soldiers, and almost none of those had been published in the United States. Uh, and in all of those instances, the, the photographers had been immediately kicked out of the embeds for taking photos. Uh, in Afghanistan recently, uh, Julie Jacobson from AP uh, took a picture of a, a, an American soldier who had just been hit by an RPG, uh, and he was in the falling, he, was, he died a few minutes later, I believe. And uh, that picture was held for weeks because the Secretary of Defense had to weigh in on it. The family had to weigh in on it. Uh, other soldiers from the unit weighed in. And it caused an enormous controversy. And I think it shows just how far the, you know, the goal markers have been moved since Vietnam, yeah. that this journalist is out there. She's taking a picture in the midst of combat. Now, we've been involved in this war for 10 years. She's there doing her job. She takes a picture in combat that shows the reality of combat and what these U.S. soldiers are going through, what they're up against, and what we're sending our sons and brothers and, you know, over, and sisters over there to do. And she can't get this picture in the paper. This becomes something that, that you know, goes through weeks of debate. And a lot of people didn't publish this photo. It, it's not only uh, the attitude toward those kind of pictures. It's the amount of control the military is able to exert. It's always been a very unpopular thing with American soldiers to take a picture of an American casualty. They've never liked it. They didn't like it right. in Vietnam. They didn't Absolutely. like it in Beirut. I've had a um, U.S. Marine threaten to shoot me uh, for taking a picture of a, a wounded Marine. Yeah. Um, but now in Iraq and Afghanistan, they can actually control what you show. Uh, and they do. Uh, it's as a, a simple a thing as the bodies coming back to Washington. They do. Uh, they do it as a matter of policy quite deliberately and as a part of their strategy, their information strategy. Yeah. Uh, well, this is such a strong like point, I think, uh, Terry, and we, I don't want to dwell on it, but one of the lessons that U.S. political leadership and the military leadership believed that they had drawn from the, the Vietnam War was, quote, television lost the war. Mark Well, uh, that the Army uh, did its own in investigation and analysis. There's a very good book, I've forgotten the author's name for the moment, called On Strategy, which blew that theory completely apart. But what did happen during the Vietnam War, it's popular to say, well, the demonstrations at home turned public opinion against the war. What was on television every night turned public opinion against the war. This is one man's opinion based on my experience, but I'm not the only one who thinks so. Those were factors. But keep in mind that television, and particularly the CBS Evening News, we didn't lead it every, in everything, but we did lead in coverage of the Vietnam War. We were putting pictures on the screen nightly from 1965 through 1968 and 9 when the pendulum swung. Nobody was saying during 1965, 1966, 1967 that it was pictures on television. Here's what turned public opinion against the Vietnam War. When the bodies started coming home, remember we lost 58,000 dead, hundreds of thousands wounded psychologically and otherwise. It wasn't until Johnny from the block over the street, the uh, block away, who two years ago was the point guard on the high school basketball team, or maybe the quarterback on the football team, 
when he came back in a flag draped casket or without his arms or blinded, that was happening day after day after day. That's what turned American opinion to questioning the war. It wasn't when the casualties started mounting, when every neighborhood in the country, remember we had the draft at that time, it wasn't an all-volunteer army. That's what turned public opinion into the questioning that resulted with this, this swing in public opinion, 1968, 1969, 1970. It wasn't the only factor, but again, mark it, note it, take it for what it may be worth. It's one person's opinion. And so the lesson drawn by political leaders past, present, and I think future, and certainly by the military, is don't show the bodies. Don't show the caskets coming back. Don't show the reality of war, as I described it when we opened this session. You know, the idea that television shows you what war is like, what it's really like, is a myth. Uh, a, a, a powerful still photograph of a soldier just hit, one where you can focus in on that moment and nothing else. The picture doesn't wiggle, if you will can be an extremely powerful, emotional, gravitational pull on a person. So you may want to keep that in mind. One of the things I want to ask, uh, I'll go down, the, before I get to that, Rajiv, it occurred to me to ask, one of the things that's changed greatly since the Vietnam War, and it's affected coverage, uh, news coverage, not just for wartime, is that in Vietnam, and excuse the personal reference here, but in television, as Terry said, we were shooting film. It may not have occurred to you, and I'm not being patronizing here, particularly younger, the tremendous difference it makes with videotape. Videotape does not have to be processed. Film, we shot, most of the Vietnam War was shot on 18 millimeter film. Some on 36 millimeter, uh, some on eight, but most 16 millimeter film. That film has to be processed in chemicals, dried, and then edited out. No electronic computer in front of you. And it was considered a coup if you covered a major battle, say, in the Yadrang Valley of Vietnam, if you could get that film flown from Vietnam to either Tokyo or Hong Kong, then to San Francisco, then to Chicago, then to New York, and if you could get it on the air in two and a half days, that was considered a scoop. Now, flash forward to today, instant coverage with satellites and our modern technology a battle in the Yadrang Valley would not be just recorded, you would be seeing it live. You see it live all the time now. This is a tremendous, tremendous difference. And the, the thing I was going to ask you about, Rajiv, is in those days, and I recognize how long ago I'm talking, journalism tended to be from the bottom up. In Vietnam, I and every other television correspondent and every other print correspondent that I knew, we went out, we sometimes stayed out for six weeks or longer, sleeping with troops, sleeping on the ground, wherever, and would, would throw the film into a yellow grapefruit bag so it could be easily recognized. But the point is, we decided what the news was. We went out and found stories, and we sent those stories back to New York saying, this is the news. Now, with all this instant communication, so much of coverage is top down. That is, the home office is on the phone with you very early in the morning, maybe in the middle morning, saying, Listen, I read in the New York Times or the Washington Post that thus and such is happening, or I've seen on the wires, or I've seen on the Twitter, or I've seen on the blog, and this is what we want today. See, there's been a, a major shift, I don't think the public understands this, that the decision making of what's news and what's covered is far more top loaded than it's ever been. Contrasted with Vietnam, we went out, we decided what was important, we wrote a script, put on one side of the paper the narration, record the narration on the other side of the paper, the pictures. My question to you as one who's been both an executive at the newspaper and a, a line reporter, how greatly has this affected in your judgment, uh, journalism as we know it today? It's a good question. And I, I wasn't trying to be distracted by looking at this. Technology is failing me at the moment. I was just trying to actually pull up the embed ground rules for journalists in Afghanistan. And I wanted to just quote from some of them, and it's a PDF, and I'm having uh, a difficulty finding the uh, relevant parts. If I do before the end, I'll, I'll, I'll share a few, because right. there are what some might suggest are pretty onerous restrictions. Others might, might view it as perfectly normal and, and responsible restrictions for journalists in, a, in wartime, but we should, we should let people decide. Um, you know, 
having been on both ends of this, um, and, and particularly with the role of technology, um, you know, th there, there have been um, uh, uh, sort of real, real transformative changes. I, I remember back to Thanksgiving 2003 in Baghdad, where we all got together, uh, some folks from New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post, for Thanksgiving dinner at the, the LA Times Bureau. And back then, it was before s cell phones were, were active in Baghdad. And so we had these Thuraya satellite phones that require you to be outside or at least have some line of sight. And so we all sort of put our phones by the front door and went in and were starting to eat turkey. And, and I, I, I noted to my friends, oh, you know, isn't it nice that at least, you know, we can have one undisturbed night. Sooner or later, they're going to, you know, the mobile phones will be here. And soon enough, off in the distance, we hear some chirping and, of course, you know, every phone's ringing, and the news has just crossed the wires that George Bush has landed in, Bag in Baghdad. And so <laughs> within three minutes, everybody jumps in their car, turkey left on the table, and, you know, runs off in the direction of their homes or toward the airport to try to see if they can get in. Um, you know, I, I think, and this may be, I may be a little bit more unique in answering this. I, I've never been in a position when I've been out in the field where I've been told, you must write it in this way. Now, have editors said, this is crossing the wires, or this is a, you know, this is a pretty big deal, this is, some, you know, this is a, a claim that is being made by, uh, by the White House spokesman or made by the Pentagon, and you should do some ground reporting on it if you can? Yes. I mean, uh, guidance like that, yes. And, and I think that's a normal part of the job. Um, thankfully, I've never been in the position of having somebody sort of say to me back in the home office after I filed a story, um, you look, you know, that's, that's overly negative or, you know, that's not what we're hearing from our sources there. My bosses were always good enough to me to let my reporting prevail and even if official Washington was going to object to it, let them have their objections but let all points of view out there and, and inevitably, of course, the objections you know, were, as, as we, we, we know so often, were, were more political spin than anything else. Um, but, but, but in one practical way, it really has created a degree of headaches. You know, our, one of our correspondents in Afghanistan has been sp spent the last sort of two weeks sort of traveling in the South. And of course, when um, a story broke in Rolling Stone 10 days ago that allegedly um, the training command was might have been using some information operations or psyops type techniques on visiting senators. Um, you know, he was called up in Kandahar and asked, well, "Could you call your sources in Kabul? Can you work this from you know the little Ford operating base you're on?" And because he has a cell phone, because he has a has a internet connected computer, you know, he's expected no matter where he is to do that, even if it's taking him away from other reporting because it's a competitive breaking story and we've got to be on it and we don't have the luxury of having an army of people to sort of cover all angles of the story. Maria well, Teresa, one of the things that's changed about the covering wars is the number of women who cover wars. Uh, in Vietnam, I was there for, for almost one full year straight through once and then back another four times and I think there might have been four or five women journalists, maybe a few more than that, but now you see women journalists covering combat uh, almost everywhere, yourself being a, a, a prime example. What do you consider the most important problem unique to a woman in a combat zone? It has some advantages. Um, you, can, you can access more the victims. I think if you have to talk to a mother or, or, or children, being a woman, it's much easier to get through than being a man. I, I've seen that in, 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 in areas where there's lots of victims. If, if a woman has to speak about, for example, sexual abuse or something like that, she would speak in a much easier way to another woman than, than speak to a man. And of course, one of the problems, a big, big problem, especially with the military, is the, the machismo, <laughs> is the assumption that if you're a woman, uh, somehow you're dumb. And, and so probably you will get, uh, you know, with some stupid explanation about something, you will, you know, you will be happy with it. And, and there's a lot of paternalizing, like uh, a patronizing, you say, you know, like, okay, you know, you, you sit there and you wait and, and we'll tell you what's going on. And, and that sort of 
especially in Latin America where you have a lot of, you know, macho kind of thing with the, with the military especially. So they, they keep, uh, you have to be stern not to let yourself be patronized. Again, uh, my father was a U.S. Marine, fought on Iwo Jima. You know, I have sympathy with the U.S. military. But um, the idea that you're going to travel halfway around the world and take part in an invasion, you know, the largest U.S. foreign policy initiative in the last 30 years, and then you deserve the right to privacy, I think that we as journalists, I think that, you know, maybe, Terry, you take issue with that. But no, I, as an ex-Marine, and, 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 you know, this is going to sound very critical of the military, um, I'm, I'm proud of having been an ex-Marine, and uh, certainly I support American military troops. So make no mistake, they don't want you to see the reality of war. Their purpose is very different from our purpose. We're there to try to tell you what's happening. They're there, in part, to prevent us from doing that. They don't want that to happen, because war is terrible. And if you see what's really going on, you're not going to support the war. It happened in Vietnam, and it happened, it's happening now, I think, in Af Afghanistan. Uh, the more you see of what happens, the less you like it. So they, they, they do everything they possibly can uh, to soften the image. Why, why do they want you to go out and take pictures on a med cap, on a, uh, what they call civil action? You go out to the little village with a, with a corpsman and give shots and, oh yeah, come along, cover that. Don't, don't cover the war. Mm -hmm. Don't cover the bodies. Don't cover the results of the drone raids, mm -hmm. even if you could. They don't want you to see that. And they spend, they have a, literally a budget of billions of dollars a year for information management. And that's aimed at you, at the American citizen, nobody else. I think we should just be careful when we say they. I mean, the U.S. I, military. I, well, but the but, but U.S. military as a whole, I, think, I, I do think that the, I've at least encountered a fair number of military personnel at sort of the rank and file level yeah. that are actually more than happy to get for, yes. for, for, for that, that for, for the real um, privations and dangers and sacrifices that their buddies are making to yes. get out there. They, they want the, the, the rest of the country to know. Um, I think what, what you're talking about is sort Pentagon of a policy and, yeah. decision made at, at much yeah. higher levels. Yeah, the absolutely. Military. But there's, there's uh, it's funny because in, in, in our countries it's the other way around. I think the military are the ones and their the generals and the Ministry of Defense who want to show that you show more the casualties of the, of the military men and how much they're suffering and when they end up uh, maimed or they, they are very much interested in that. What's very difficult to show is the other way, the other side to, to mm -hmm. be able to interview the civilians. Yeah. Very interesting point. I want to point out we're going to open this up to questions in uh, just a few minutes. Um, I want to come back to this question of embedded or independent. Understand that a journalist now, ostensibly at least, has a choice. That you can embed with the military and say, okay, I want to be embedded with this unit, in some cases with these units in this particular area. And you make an agreement as an embed, uh, this paragraph or two that Rajiv just read, part of the agreement if you're embedded. Now, you can at least ostensibly choose not to embed but as I think uh, either Mike or Rajiv maybe both mentioned, it's really not that much of an option in Afghanistan because the only transport, if you want to get from Kabul to Kandahar, the only way to get there is by military aircraft. Uh, you can drive, you can choose to drive, uh, but virtually signing uh, a, a death warrant, you may or may not make it. My point is, uh, what I want to get to is that I don't think the public fully understands. During the Vietnam War, as a uh, correspondent, you could go anywhere you wanted to go. You could get just about anywhere, and pretty much when you wanted to get there. And the military would take you there, or you did have the availability in a lot of sections to get there on your own. Point being that there weren't any embeds during the Vietnam War. The photographers and correspondents uh, and the material was not censored in, in any way. There were, no, there were no agreements with the military. You were, if you will, uh, sort of a, a traveling witness to the war. Now, the military taking the lessons that they thought were lessons out of the Vietnam War said, never again are we going to give 
press people that kind of freedom. And that's what brought us to the embed uh, policy, which started with Gulf War I and now has been um, refined, if you want to use that word, for subsequent wars. It's worth remembering that in World War II, American journalists covering combat were in uniform. Yeah. Uh, you had the equivalent rank of major for such things as chow lines and uh, domicile and that sort of thing. But the, the Charles Collingwoods, Edward R. Murrows, Eric Severides, these are the icons of World War II broadcast coverage, were all in uniform. And what they wrote uh, and what they put, wrote for radio, uh, what photographers did, were put through a, a line of, of, had to be approved by the local commander. You could appeal it to the regional commander, the area command if you want, and you could appeal it all the way uh, to uh, General George Marshall in Washington. And it takes too long to tell, but the late great Charles Collingwood, when American troops were sent to North Africa in World War II, unprepared, ill-equipped, and I don't want to use the phrase, has their heads handed to them, but they were roundly defeated. Collingwood wrote for radio a piece which was not approved by the local commander, wasn't approved by the area commander, wasn't approved by the theater commander, Dwight David Eisenhower, but was appealed all the way to Marshall in Washington, and Marshall said, we don't censor battle, battleground reports. My, my question, I want to go down the line here. What would be better and has some chance, some chance of being approved as a practical matter by the political and military leadership other than embedding? Go back to being in uniform, go back to the Vietnam time. What's better than embeds, Terry? The kind of freedom you're talking about in Vietnam and we had in, in Beirut um, is, is an exception, not sure. the rule. I mean, uh, in Beirut, because the Americans were not in charge of this multi-factional, multi-sided 16-year civil war, we could go anywhere and talk to anybody for the first half of it. Um, you could talk to the Syrians, you could talk to, I got picked up one day by Abu Nidal, world's worst terrorist, got an interview and a cup of coffee, he went off down the road. Um, I went out one day uh, with Don Mel, a photographer, to the airport to a bunch of Druze militiamen who decided to get in a gunfight with the Marines. Don almost got blown away uh, by a 50 caliber machine gun. We left, went back into central Beirut, went back out the airport road into the Marine headquarters, out to the front Marine lines and talked to the guy on the machine gun and said, you know, you almost blew him away. And the Marines sitting there saying, what the hell were you doing out there? That's the enemy. The total freedom, go anywhere you want. Until um, the Iranian, pro-Iranian uh, Islamic Amal, they called themselves at first, later Hezbollah, showed up, and we lost our immunity. And I think that was one of the first times that happened in those kind of wars. We had a certain amount of immunity even with the bad guys. We were journalists, and they wanted to tell their story. I, I went out to the airport one day, went through an Islamic Amal checkpoint, showed my press card from Amal. The guy looked at it, threw it on the ground, and spit on it. I am not Amal, I am Islamic Amal. And that's when it started getting very bad. And that's when people started getting kidnapped and killed, as, you know, they didn't care. Journalists, remember, most of the people kidnapped in Lebanon, the foreigners, were, could be said to have been sympathetic to the Shia, or, or at least not enemies. There was a Catholic priest giving out money. There was a Presbyterian minister who lived as a missionary. There was a dean of agriculture. There were, I told people they'd never kidnap me because I'm telling their story. I was reporting on the Israeli occupation of South Lebanon, and the Israelis blacklisted me. They hated me. The Israeli general said to me one day, why, why do you keep reporting bad stuff about us? I said, General, don't do it bad, and I won't report it bad. Um, <laughs> But um, that changed. And from then on, I think from Lebanon on, journalists became targets. They were deliberately targeted as a tactic and for political goals and for other goals. And, and that has made it highly dangerous, 
very difficult, and it has brought this question of embedment. It's got two sides. Number one, it's a wonderful PR coup by the military. Absolutely. You can't expect any journalist to f eat, sleep, and fight with young American, well-trained, admirable soldiers and not write good things about them. Right? Um, uh, so they do. At the same time, it's become so dangerous not to be. You know, you, you, you can't go out wandering around in a countryside. You couldn't for much of the Iraq War, and you certainly can in Afghanistan. So what do you get? You get a war about Americans. The Iraq War is not about Iraqis, it's about Americans. The Afghan War is not about Afghanis, it's about Americans. As far as, how, you know, this is a very well-educated, well-informed group, right? How many of you really know how many Iraqis died in the Iraqi War? Don't everybody How many of you know how many Afghans have died so far in the Afghani War? It's not about the Iraqis or the Afghans from our news coverage. It's about the Americans. Oh, sorry. It's their country and their war, and we should be paying some attention to what's happening to them, to the effect our policies and our actions are having on them. It's not our war. It's theirs. And that's the big weakness that has developed out of this embedment, coupled with very real danger for journalists on the other side. You get a one-sided view of what's going on. Well, on that note, Terry, we're about five minutes late in doing this, and we'll extend this session for at least five minutes, which is to say until 2.35. We don't intend to keep you here forever. If you have a question, we ask you to go to the microphone, and we'll do our very best uh, to uh, either answer it or tell you we don't know the answer. Yes, sir. If you yeah. identify yourself, please. Yeah, my name is Dave Goldner. I'm a student here at SEPA. First of all, thanks. Uh, it's rare to see so much uh, bravery and talent in one uh, panel at SEPA. Um, my question is probably for Rajiv or Mike. Um, you talked a lot about technology and how it's changed the way you do your, uh, your job. Um, do you see any evidence that the, some of the bad actors are also using technology? Uh, you mentioned uh, that Mike mentioned that he feels like sometimes he has a price on his head. Um, is it possible they know where you stay? They know uh, what your email is? They know what your pimped out uh, Jeep looks like? And how does that affect, if, if at all, your job? Yeah, I don't think they're actually able to sort of intercept phone calls, but they're certainly using technology. They use, uh, you know, SMS. They, they use email. Um, it was a case uh, in Iraq, I believe in 04, where an Australian journalist was kidnapped and by, uh, by Sadrists, and he was trying to convince them, look, you know, I've been very supportive of liberation movements. I was with guerrillas in East Timor. And they actually went and Googled it, uh, Googled him, and they found that he was telling the truth, and 24 hours later he was let go. Now, that's, that's generally the exception, not the rule. But um, uh, everybody's using technology. Uh, in, in, a, in a new and somewhat sophisticated way. Um, you know, the U.S. military spends uh, on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars trying to counter what they call insurgent uh, electronic propaganda, uh, you know, m text messages and other things that, that Taliban send one another. I just want to use this, make one more point uh, just on, on the earlier stuff. Um, I just want to note, I, I'm not trying to argue that, that there's an active campaign of censorship by, by the military. They have the ground rules, but nobody, they don't look at photos before you send them. They don't look at my stories. This isn't World War II, at least not on the U.S. side. There are reports that the British military does do that in parts of Afghanistan, that they're operating under Green Book rules, but not the U.S. There isn't any sort of pre-clearance of, of material. And I, I don't actually think that a government run, that, that, that the solution here is actually the government changing the embed policies. I just don't see that happening. I, I wish we could go to a world where news organizations had the resources to have more Afghans, more Iraqis, who are able to operate in these environments better tell the stories. I think back to one of my the stories I think was, was one of the best done stories in the early weeks of the Iraq War, where two great correspondents, Pulitzer Prize winner Anthony Shadid and Pulitzer Prize winner Tom Ricks of the Washington Post, went together. And Tom walked with the military on a patrol. And as they walked into, you know, to talk to various Iraqis and, you know, got these guys afterwards, say, ah, oh, yeah, we really made friends with him. We were, you know, uh, another, another guy on our side. And then Anthony would follow in and sort of talk to them in Arabic, because he's a fluent Arabic speaker. And he'd say, oh, yes, those guys, they were just leering at my daughters. They're here to steal my stuff. <laughs> And they put this story together that was phenomenal. They just looked at the, com the, the, the completely divergent narratives of war. And that's the sort of thing that we just don't see much anymore. True. Next question. 
First, ma'am and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. It's really enlightening. And would you here. identify yourself, please? Sure. My name is Randy Clinton. Thank you, um, Randy. And uh, I have a question, something that you alluded to earlier about how this new age of information puts the sensational aspect of, of the information out there before any context. Uh, do you have any solutions for, the, for, the, for that one? How do you add more context? How do you get rid of some of the sensationalists of war and, and provide real context, not just to the immediate of someone being hurt or dying, but overall the, uh, the context of war and, and show that picture? Well, thank you for the question. First of all, uh, uh, one, it's not a solution, but one thing that would help would be a better educated consumer. No, I'm not selling suits for those of you who live in New York, but there's uh, a guy who has a commercial about suits. <laughs> But a better educated news consumer is more essential now than ever before uh, for, for a long list of reasons, not the least of which we at least alluded to earlier. There was a time if you were a newspaper reporter. Sometimes this happens at the better news organizations, but by and large now, it used to be you had a deadline maybe once a day. Or if you're working on something lengthy, you had a deadline two days or maybe a week. Now your average reporter, whether it's broadcast, uh, television, radio, maybe a little less so with newspapers, but I don't think so, is expected to Twitter, to blog, uh, to file several times a day in the case of broadcast journalists at any rate. There is now in the 24-hour news cycle and now in the second decade of the 21st century, there's a deadline every nanosecond for uh, uh, many, many reporters. There used to be a deadline once a day. And it was a deadline two or three times a day. Now it's a, you have a deadline every nanosecond. Because if you are working on something, you say, I want to work on this today. I want to take time to think about it. And then you get a bulletin from your home office, text to you, so-and-so is carrying thus and such. What say you? And you're expected to respond almost immediately. That's the reality for many, many reporters. But as a consumer, most experienced reporters know, even those who've covered the police beat for as much as six months, very often the first things you hear are either wrong or they have a lot that's not very accurate about them. And it's particularly true of natural disasters or the outbreak of war. Uh, the first things you hear are not, not always right. In fact, they're often wrong. So as a consumer, you need to have that in mind. We take you now by the magic of television to the streets of Cairo or Tripoli, and here's our reporter, uh, uh, John Jones. John Jones may have, no fault of his, may have just landed at the airport and barely got to the hotel balcony. John Jones doesn't know a whole lot more than you do. But John Jones can't keep his job if he says, if the anchor person says, well, what's going on there? And if John Jones says, well, to tell you the truth, that John or Mary, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> Which, yes, Roger. But, but 30 years ago, I mean, the telex would clatter with the uh, message, why we unhave. You know, yeah. the home offices have always sort of pestered people, I think. Yeah. Although, can I just, just say, sure. you, you're looking for a piece of practical advice, and those of you writing stuff to post on the web, please don't use this and save my job. But <laughs> if you're lucky enough to get to a place like Afghanistan, and you're getting pestered by the home office, just shut your phone off. And then, you know, they'll say, oh, we're trying to reach you. Oh, those Afghan networks, they're so flaky. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, have, I want to agree with Dan. I've been teaching journalism for quite a while at several different schools. And the first thing I have to do with my journalism students is teach them exactly that, how to be critical consumers of news, how to recognize what they're seeing on the television and what they're reading in the newspaper, how to recognize the good stuff from the bad stuff. I can't teach them what the good stuff is if they can't recognize it. There is lots of great journalism being committed out there, even on television. There's lots of great journalism around. But there's an awful lot of crap. And you've got to learn how to distinguish from it. If you get, I'm sorry, if you get all your news from the 6 o'clock news on television, you are sadly badly informed. You need to be reading at least two or three different newspapers, including one that you totally disagree with. I used, for years, I used to love to read the National Review because William Buckley was brilliant. I hated everything he said and disagreed with him completely, but he was a brilliant man who made you think. Yeah. And you, you, need to, you need to be open to information that you are not necessarily comfortable with. But one important point with that, and we'll move on to the next question because I do want to move on, is we don't always succeed. What reporters widely believe it may not be, but true it is, try hard not to be cynical. But we're professionally trained to be skeptical. And there's a big difference. 
You can look it up in the dictionary. Skepticism is vital for a reporter, but not cynicism. And I would say the same thing for consumers of, of news. Very important to be skeptical, particularly about things the first time you hear them, the first things that come out of a breaking news story, uh, but not cynicism. I would argue that cynicism is, uh, is not in keeping with the American character. Next question, sir. Uh, hello. My name is Zachary Kagan. I'm a writer for Columbia's Blue and White. And let me just say it's an honor to be speaking to a group of people who probably between them have double-digit appearances on The Daily Show. <laughs> um, but what I'd like to ask about is uh, what do you people believe is the influence of journalism and journalists on the ongoing uh, protests and revolutions in the Middle East, starting with Tunisia and Egypt and the current revolution against uh, Myanmar Gaddafi? It's uh, been an important point in the news. Najib, why don't you take that one? Um, I want to hear what Terry has to say on... on I was going to, I was going to make a, distinguished, a distinction between information and journalists, particularly in Egypt. Because an awful lot of what we saw coming out of Egypt was not coming from professional journalists. It was coming from people with, you know, phones and Twitter and things like that. And the great triumph of journalism, if you will, there was managing to keep that stream of information going despite all the efforts of an autocratic and initially very strong government to stop it. And they couldn't do it. They just couldn't stop the... And it was that information feeding back, I think, that helped to encourage the Egyptians to continue their resistance. Well, but, but I, when you get beyond social media, I think the, the, the most powerful force for that democratic change that, is, that has been occurring uh, in, in, in parts of the Middle East has, is, is, is the very television network that has been so lambasted in this absolutely. country as a force of extremism and backwardness and uh, uh, undemocratic views and whatnot. And I think everybody knows what I'm talking about, Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera kicked American networks butt. Well, partly because they have a lot of part, partly because they have a lot of resources on the ground, which American networks, having gone through a contraction, particularly foreign coverage in recent years, didn't have nearly as many boots on the ground, nearly as many resources. I'm so sorry. Thank you for the question. I'm so sorry. I'm told by our time police, who are um, in plain clothes here, but we have time police that that will be the last of our questions. We thank you very much for being here. We thank you for attention, your attention. And don't forget that there is a, uh, another, uh, starting at 4 o'clock, is it? Yeah. Uh, which will we'll deal with some of these issues we dealt with the last, which is the influence of social media on what's happening in the Middle East and elsewhere. Thank you very much, and good afternoon. <laughs>